On a cold morning in November, 11-year-old Johan's mother left for work as usual, leaving Johan alone in their home. But this was the last time that she would ever see her son before he mysteriously disappeared. Today, over 40 years after Johan went missing, his parents do believe that they know what happened to him, but the questions might never be answered. This is the unsolved disappearance of 11-year-old Johan Asplund. <laughs> true crime cases that have occurred in the Nordic countries. I'm so sorry for being super inactive on this channel, I have been moving and to be honest, painting the whole house has been a lot harder than I thought. I will try to be back to posting consistently as soon as possible, but until then just bear with me. I also want to warn sensitive people, this video will include talks about the disappearance of a child, so if that's something that you don't want to watch then I suggest you click out of this video right now. I will also go into some different theories, and one of them includes cannibalism, so just a warning for everyone watching. With that being said, now let's get into the case that happened in Sweden. Johan Asplund was born on the 3rd of August 1969 in Stockholm, Sweden, making him 11 years old at the time of the events in this case. Apart from being a regular young boy, he was described as a happy and smiley, very soft-hearted boy who loved his cat even if he originally wanted a dog. He also loved playing sports as he played football and badminton, and he was overall this kind of kid that was just loved by everyone around him. Johan's parents got married when they were young, and Johan's mother had Johan when she was only 22 years old. But even if they were young parents, it does not mean that they loved him any less, because he was described as being the apple of their eyes. Unfortunately, their marriage eventually ended, and they got divorced in 1972, when Johan was three years old. The split was not very dramatic, and they remained pretty good friends, mainly for Johan's sake. Johan's father ended up moving back to where he was from in north of Sweden, but still remained a good father who was a part of his son's life. He eventually married another woman, and they had two daughters together, and Johan got along well with all of them. Johan's mother also ended up meeting a new man who she was working with, and his name is not public, so I will just be calling him Johan's stepfather or the stepfather in this video. They ended up moving in together, and they eventually moved to another city, because he got a new job offer there. This city is called Sundsvall, and it was also closer to where Johan's father lived, so it was not even a question about it, and they settled in a pretty nice neighborhood. But once they were settled, their relationship started to take a turn for the worse. Johan's stepfather became controlling and very jealous, especially when Johan's mother was talking to other men. And she was working as a nurse, so she had to communicate with patients, even men, and he was working in the same workplace, so he would constantly check what she was doing and who she was talking to. His behavior only got worse over time, which is typical for mental abuse, and he started threatening Johan's mother, saying that he would hurt Johan if she did something wrong. After five years of living in this mess, she eventually left him in 1979, and he ended up moving out of the house. But even after breaking up, he was still stalking and watching her, as neighbors has described seeing him around the area day and night. He would also call her constantly, even if she made it clear that she did not want him in his life at all. But Johan's mother just hoped that if she kept on ignoring him, maybe he would eventually stop. She was not interested in starting any new relationship, but she was casually dating and seeing some men when Johan was with his father. So now I will get into talking about the day that Johan tragically disappeared. Johan was excited for Father's Day that was coming up, and he had invited a friend to spend it with him and his father's side of the family. The 7th of November 1980 started out as a regular cold fall day, and the first signs of winter was starting to show in Sweden. Johan's mother had a bit of a cold, but she still decided to go to work that day, so she got up early and made breakfast for Johan. 
She had packed everything ready for Johan to go to his father's place after school that day and she put clothes ready for him to wear on the bed and left for work at 7.45 a.m. After she left, Johan was supposed to get ready for school and she would usually call him after she clocked in at the hospital to check that everything was okay. But this particular day, she actually forgot to call him, probably due to some distraction at work. So she arrived home after working the morning shift at around 12.30 and everything seemed normal. She assumed that Johan was at school and her ex-husband, so Johan's father, would pick him up after school. As I said, it was Father's Day that weekend, so Johan, his dad and the dad's new wife and their two daughters would spend the weekend together. Johan's mom and dad had a good relationship and they had no problem co-parenting. Johan's mom realized that he had only eaten a little bit of the breakfast that she made in the morning and he had not finished his hot chocolate. The shirt that she had picked up for him was still laying on the bed, but his shoes and school bag was gone. So it kind of looked like he had been in a hurry to leave, but apart from that, nothing really looked out of the ordinary or strange, and she just thought that he was a boy and maybe he had just put on a t-shirt instead. When Johan's father went to pick Johan up after school, it was strange because Johan was not there waiting for him. Johan's mother was just at home thinking that everything was fine when Johan's friend called and asked why Johan never came to school that day. This was the friend who was supposed to spend Father's Day with Johan and Johan's father's side of the family, so he was wondering if the plans had changed. At first, Johan's mother just thought that this was some kind of misunderstanding and the friend came to their place to wait for Johan. So Johan's father also came to their place as he thought that Johan must have just gone home after school and he realized that Johan was not there either. So they were just all there waiting for Johan to come home and eventually his mother started to get worried. She knew that something was not right so she called the school and they confirmed that Johan had not been in school that day. And from my understanding, schools usually contact the parents if a child does not show up for school without any sort of reason, but then I remembered that this was in the 1980s, so I think schools were just not working the way that they do today. But it's just super sad and unfortunate that they could have started looking for him much earlier and possibly even found him alive if the school would have just done something about this situation. But anyway, Johan's parents were now unsure what to do and they decided to call the police and report him missing at 3.40 p.m. They also decided to call a local radio station to report about the incident and they searched the whole apartment building and the area where they lived along with the neighbors and friends, but they found nothing. Basically, no one had seen Johan outside of the apartment that day and no one knew where he was. So Johan Asplund was an 11-year-old boy, 150 centimeters tall, with medium-length light brown hair. As I said before, he was a happy-go-lucky child who got along with pretty much everyone. On the day that he disappeared, he was wearing a blue jacket, jeans, brown snow boots, and a red school bag, and a red winter hat. He was only in fifth grade and a big search was started since pretty much everyone around him said that he would have never wanted to leave by himself. He had a good relationship with both his parents and he had exciting plans, so why would he want to leave? The conclusion was that someone must have taken him, but who? The people around him also believed that he would have never left with just some random stranger, so they believed that it was someone who he trusted. Johan's mother has stated that she straight away just had a feeling that he was not alive anymore and this is something that I have heard in many cases that the mother just knew that their child was not around anymore or mothers who have just gotten a feeling that something is not right with their child and then they turn out to be missing or dead and I do believe that this is some kind of mother instinct that a mother just knows when her child is not okay or around anymore. But Johan's mother still knew that she had to keep on going and try to find him regardless. So people in the apartment building were questioned and a classmate reported seeing him in the doorway that morning when he himself was on his way out. The door had been opened and it looked like he was looking inside waiting for someone. Johan was fully dressed with winter clothes and they had greeted each other when he passed by, but Johan seemed distracted and confused. 
Many people are wondering what this meant and question if there was maybe someone in the apartment that made him feel distracted or uncomfortable. This was at 7.56 in the morning and this boy was the last person to ever see Yuhan before he mysteriously disappeared. Just moments later, at 8 in the morning, two girls living next door found Yuhan's cat, so they went knocking on the door, but they got no answer. Another friend who usually walked to school with Yuhan was waiting for him at their meeting spot, but he never arrived. So Yuhan's mother, of course, told investigators about her breakup from Yuhan's stepfather about a year before. He was 41 years old and she was concerned about him, so the police interrogated him in his house only hours after Johan disappeared. Johan's stepfather opened the door, all tired, and he seemed depressed and like he had just woken up. He ended up being interviewed many times in the days that followed, and he was calculating and a bit reserved when he answered questions. He actually refused answering some of the questions. Witnesses had seen his white Volvo in the neighborhood in the morning of the disappearance and also many times in the weeks leading up to Johan's disappearance. The police strongly believed that this was to calculate their routines, but he insisted that he had nothing to do with it, even though he did not really have any alibi for that morning either. Since he used to live there with Johan and his mother, people around recognized him and one neighbor remembers seeing him and telling him the good news about her pregnancy as she had been trying to get pregnant for a very long time. Since the stepfather was a nurse and knew about her struggles getting pregnant, she was surprised that he ignored her. The police now saw him as a prime suspect, but there was not really any evidence against him, so they could not arrest him. I mean, there was no weapon, no body, no DNA, and only witness statements saying that he was in the area that morning. When the news started to report about him in the media, they just called him Johan Mannan, which translates to the Johan man. People who knew him were surprised at how cold and uncaring he was about Johan's disappearance since he knew the family and he had been Johan's stepfather. He had also told a friend that there was no point looking for Johan, which definitely makes it seem like he knew that Johan was not around anymore. Johan's mother was of course living a nightmare and in the days after the disappearance she recalled having a dream of almost finding him and then waking up. She described waking up to the reality that Johan was missing as worse than the dream itself. After a few weeks, she had to go back to work, but she spent all her free time trying to find answers to what happened. One night, she woke up and felt as if something was not right, so she turned on the light and saw Johan's toy standing on her bedside table with the weapons pointing at her. She, of course, jumped out of the bed and started looking for Johan, but found nothing. The police did not take her seriously and thought that she had placed the toys there herself and forgot about it. But she knew that someone had been in her apartment and today she believes that this was Johan's stepfather, possibly trying to make it seem as if Johan was still alive. Johan's father was soon charged with kidnapping as the laws in Sweden says that someone can be sued personally with an individual prosecution through a lawyer. During the 80s in Sweden, this was super rare, but it's sometimes been done if the person is super sure that they are gonna win the case. If they lose, however, they have to pay for everything, even the other person's lawyer and costs, so it's a pretty risky move. And Johan's parents were not rich, but to them it was worth it, no matter the cost. They felt sure that Johan's stepfather had waited for Johan's mother to leave in the morning before kidnapping and murdering him. Johan's stepfather had actually confessed to murdering Johan in a phone conversation with a priest, but he was not called to testify in court because of the priest's confidentiality. And I hope that I said that word correctly, because it was very hard for me to say. Anyway, the court ruled that Johan's stepfather did take Johan, but not with the intention to kill him, and five years after Johan's disappearance, he was sentenced to two years in prison. And from what I understood, this is actually the harshest sentence ever given in an individual prosecution, which is crazy since it's literally nothing. 
Johan's parents actually appealed this since they thought that he should also be sentenced for murdering Johan and this actually ended up turning on them. So after serving only one year in prison in 1986, Johan's stepfather was acquitted of all charges. This was due to lack of evidence and the parents' lawyer has actually been highly criticized for this since they appealed and it eventually led to the stepfather being released from prison and I'm guessing that people believe that he should have known that this was gonna happen. Johan's parents at first would have had to pay more than half a million Swedish krones in legal fees, so about 50,000 euros, but in the end the court ruled that they did not have to pay. For many years after this, the investigation went cold until 1993, so 13 years after Johan's disappearance. At this time, a 42-year-old patient at a mental facility confessed to abducting and murdering Johan. This was a man that is today called Thomas Quick, and I have been thinking about making a separate video about him, but in conclusion, he committed a robbery and held two people hostages and was sentenced to care in an institution for the criminally insane. In therapy, he confessed to over 30 unsolved murders in the Nordic countries, but there was no other evidence against him except these confessions. So he was believed to be one of the worst serial killers in Swedish history until he suddenly withdrew all of his confessions in 2008. His conviction was dropped and he was released from the mental institution, which has been called the largest miscarriage of justice in Swedish history. It's today unclear if these confessions were actually true or false, but most people seem to believe that they were false and it's a pretty interesting story. Anyway, Thomas claimed that he had driven to Johan's city in a car that he had borrowed looking for a young boy when Johan walked past. He tricked him by saying that he had a cat in his car and slammed his head into the car and took him. He then drove to another area where he abused and strangled him until he died before dismembering his body. Thomas's story changed a bit through time though, and he even claimed that he ate some of Johan's body parts. Pretty much everyone thought that the case was now gonna be solved and Thomas took the police to the place where he had disposed of Johan's head and clothes. During this time he had visible anxiety attacks and it was believed that he was reliving the crime. After many interviews, he also confessed to what he did to the rest of Johan's body. He said that he drove up a hill and he was gonna throw Johan's body down it and then end his own life by jumping after it, but he ended up just throwing the body instead. It's important to mention that Thomas had a hard time describing Johan's clothing that day and he could not give a description of his school bag. He also changed what car he was driving that day from dark blue to light blue and the person he claimed that he had borrowed this car from never owned a blue car. Five years later he claimed that the car was actually red but the owner to the car claimed that he never borrowed him his car and testing also showed no evidence of blood or other traces in this car. On top of that, Thomas's sister claimed that he was not able to drive and did not even have a driver's license until seven years after Johan's disappearance. Also, none of the places that he claimed that he disposed of Johan's head and clothes turned out to lead to anything. He then again changed his story, claiming that his brother had helped him in Johan's murder before changing this again, telling them that this was his alter ego named Cliff. So, I mean, it's pretty clear that he's lying at this point. He has changed his story so many times and that's usually a sign of a false confession. In March of 2001, the trial against Thomas started. The prosecutor claimed that maybe the evidence had been destroyed in the 13 years since the murder and charged him despite lack of evidence. Thomas claimed that Johan had a scar on his tummy that was also incorrect as he never had any surgery that would leave this type of scar. So Johan's parents believed what most of us probably believed that Thomas had made a false confession and that the police were trying to link him to Johan's murder, possibly feeding him information about the case and giving him clues. Many people also believe that his mental state could have contributed to this false confession. On the 21st of June 2001, Thomas Quick was found guilty of the murder of Johan and was ordered to stay in a mental institution for the criminally insane, but he was later acquitted as he took back his confession of Johan and all the other murders. 
He blamed childhood trauma for his confession, and I'm not really sure what he means by that, but it turned out that all of the places that he took police where he claimed that Johan's body parts were, they were all connected to his childhood or family in some kind of way. In one of the places, for example, he had buried the body of his unborn brother with his dad. He was also very into true crime and took a lot of inspirations to his confessions from different true crime cases that he had been following. So now not only Johan's family, but also the families to all the other victims were back at square one and unfortunately Johan's killer or whereabouts have never been found. In 2014, a man that had not been named in the media had recorded when another man confessed to killing Johan. This man claimed that in the morning he had waited for Johan's mother to leave and had then called the apartment, convincing Johan to meet him downstairs so that he could drive him to school. He had then used chloroform to make Johan unconscious and drove to a cabin in the woods where he realized that Johan was no longer alive. He then panicked and hid the body. But this turned out to be another false confession and the man ended up being charged for this. And I just think that this is so awful and it's actually something that happens more than you can imagine that a person gives a false confession to a murder or a disappearance. And I just always wonder what the motive is behind a false confession, like is it to get attention or why give a desperate family false hopes? In 2018, Johan's family declared Johan dead after almost 40 years of no answers. They never gave up on keeping his story alive, even if they know that no one will ever be prosecuted for what happened. They strongly believe that Johan's stepfather is guilty, and they today have a pretty good picture of what they think happened to Johan that day. Basically, they think that Johan's stepfather waited for his mother to leave for work and lured Johan to meet him outside. He probably threatened to hurt Johan's mother if Johan did not comply and then kidnapped him and killed him. He then disposed of his body, possibly at the toxic waste disposal unit at the hospital where he worked. They believe this because the lock to the outhouse where the hospital waste was disposed of had been broken on the exact day that Johan went missing, and on top of that, the stepfather's Volvo had been seen around the place even if he was not working that day. The motive is believed to be a punishment to Johan's mother, so his ex. And I honestly don't even have words for that. I mean, that's just the worst punishment that anyone can get. In March of 2022, he was questioned again after the police received an anonymous letter saying that he had confessed to his family members. During questioning, he claimed that his strange behavior after Johan's death was to show respect for Johan's parents and he still to this day denied having anything to do with the disappearance. This case is still an open missing persons case and Johan's parents are left with the memories of their son who would today have been in his 50s while someone got away with one of the worst crimes possible. But that's all that I have for this case. Thank you so much for watching and I hope that I will see you in my next video. Goodbye everyone.